Bibles and turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. 1 Chronicles chapter 21. I woke up this morning and had been thinking about this verse in verse 23 where Ornan said, I give it all. But in going through the text again this morning, the Lord changed my heart. And I want to talk for a moment about personal responsibility, about making things right. So starting in verse 1 of chapter 21, the Bible says, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Joab answered the Lord, uh, and Joab, uh, Joab answered the Lord, make his people as a hundred times and so many more as they be. But my Lord, the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then doth my Lord require this thing? Why will he cause of trespass to Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Wherefore Joab departed and went through out all Israel and came to Jerusalem. And Joab gave the sum of the number of the people unto David. And, and all they of Israel were a thousand thousand and a hundred thousand men that drew sword. And Judah was four hundred threescore and ten thousand men that drew sword. But Levi and Benjamin counted he not among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. And God was displeased with this thing, therefore he smote Israel. The king's king was displeased with the king. Let's pray. Our gracious heavenly Father, Lord, we take this time to glean from your word, Lord, and we thank you and praise you for it. Lord, I pray that you open our eyes and our hearts to see here what can be gleaned from this entire chapter here in chapter 21. We don't glean of a man who's perfect. We glean about a man who's made mistakes. But we even glean even further that a man who made mistakes but got things right. Lord, may we learn even in our own lives. It's that not that we will be perfect, it's that we'll make mistakes, but it's the desire to get things right. We give thanks to you for all that you've done and, and praise you in your name. Amen. This taken up from here in chapter 21, it was, a, it was a glorious time in the life of Israel. It was like this victorious time. I mean, they were really winning battles after battles. The Syrians were just defeated. I mean, they had literally fled from the face of Israel. Amnon was wasted. Rabbah was wasted. The Philistines and the Moabites, they were all subdued. And this was this great moment of victory in the children of Israel's life. But the problem wasn't that the victories were too small. Matter of fact, the victories were so grand that there was no denying the fact that it was God who wrought the victories. Yet what we find here in these first seven verses of chapter 21 is that David, in the midst of all of these great victories, has forgotten who has wrought the victories in Israel's life. He's forgotten where the victories has come from. He had forgotten where the strength had even come from from to fight. He had forgotten who had even enlisted him into the battle to fight. And this is what we first glean in this first verse, that there are consequences for bad decisions. A lesson we learn from here after these victories is to be careful of our decisions. After we often say to ourselves is that 
You know, when you're down and you're out, you've got to be careful about the decisions that you make when you're down and out because that's when Satan tries to get us. And that's a true statement. But there is also an even grander danger for the believer that after we have great victories and after we have great successes, that Satan will allow us, uh, lead us to a place that we have reached a place of security, that we have reached a place of settledness, that we have reached a place of self-reliability. And that is the furthest thing from where we actually are. And it's the furthest thing from where David was. Mountaintop moments calls for careful decision-making. High times they were in, grand times of great victory, but here we see the ailment of humanity. We see the ailment of human pride <laughs> that we can turn a corner and really think that we've arrived somewhere because we've done something. We see that in these first three verses of chapter 21. Actually, we could actually just start in verse number two. You ever read something, and when you read it, or you ever heard something when you heard it, you know that there's something else going on, that there's just so much more to the story than what you just read or than what you just heard? I go through this all the time, even in my own home. My son Levi will come to me and say, Dad, do you think if I take this outside to the garbage can at nighttime, somebody's going to grab me and run off with me? And I just paused and said, who told you that, Caleb or Seth? Because I know that both of them like to harass him and make him think things that are not true. Just hearing this makes me believe that somebody else is involved. That's exactly where I see this situation coming in here to verse number two. It says, and David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. This is a moment of pride. This is a moment where David this man after God's own heart has left being after God's own heart. The attempt to number the people was an attempt to inflate his own pride. It was an inflate to add a number to his power, uh, to the people who was under him. My army, my people, my possessions, my victories were all from those who are under my hand. And doing this, we know that he forsook God. It, it, it's pride that makes us look to ourselves instead of God. It is pride that causes us to look to our possessions for security instead of God. This order passed down from David. It was in order to forget the power of God. That's really what it was. As a matter of fact, Joab thought it was abominable. To even, even take on such a thing. Why? Because had David even thought about the history of Israel, he would have known to never do this. But this was an attempt to say that we now, as God's people, we now, as the children of Israel, have power from our numbers. Had he sat back and thought about Gideon and his mighty army of 300, he knows that would have defuncted this thought process. Matter of fact, had he sat back down and thought about Hezekiah and the 250,000 that were killed outside of the walls, that mighty army that Sennacherib had, that Assyrian army, had he just sat down and thought about that, God killed 250,000 without one lifting a sword. Had he thought even further about the history of Israel, he would have remembered the battle of Ai and the mighty victory that God had wrought. Numbers did not make Israel great then. Numbers did not make Israel great in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. And numbers did not make Israel great today. It was God. 
It was God that did this. But this is our own downfall. Staying like David, pride, comfort, possessions. It brings us to a place where it seems that we forsake God. And it leads us to a place where we begin to think that we don't need God. Comfort had brought David to a place of trespass against God. Now, reading this in verse 2 leads us to only one understanding, and that is Satan is at work. I mean, we really don't even need verse 1, do we? Do we really need verse 1? And it says, and Satan stood up against Israel. Do we really need that to understand that when a man does something that God has commanded him not to do, that Satan is at work? Do we really need for us to understand even in our own lives when we do something that is against God's work, that Satan is at work? We don't need that. But it is the recognition that we should realize what's going on in our lives. Verse 1 applies to us when we also commit things that are against God's work. Satan has stood up against us. He has stood up to trouble us in our own lives. That's who was provoking. Satan was provoking. Now, we see here in verse 1, and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number the people. So who was Satan after here? We say, well, Satan was clearly after David. David stood up, and he was the one that Satan was using to provoke the people. But that's not what the verse says. The verse says, and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number the children of Israel. Satan chose David to bring judgment upon all of God's people. That's an interesting thought. Matter of fact, I guess if we wanted to give ourselves some New Testament application here, that it still works in this very same manner. Read the book of Acts. The consequences of one person's decision to sin, just like David's sin affected the entire body of Israel, one person's sin inside the church can affect the entire body of the church. That's the reality of sin. That's the understanding for us in sin. I mean, David even said in Psalms chapter 38, what did he say? I will be sorry for my sin. That is this penitent uh, psalm that David has where he's pouring out his heart to God. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for my sin. But recognize, even though we pour out in regret and repentance for our sin, even the sin in Psalms 38, it affected everyone around David. And even them cost the people their lives. That's the reality of bad decisions. That's the consequences of bad decisions. We live in this kind of fictitious bubble that we sin and it's our sin and it's our private sin and it has no bearing. What does it matter? It's my problem. It's, my, it's not only your problem, it's our problem too. We say, stop it now. But does it, if your toe's infected, does your mind know it? Does the, does the foot, does the hands know that there's an impeding with the foot when the foot is harmed? Of course it does. The body functions together. And so it is. We function together. And this is why we're called. What We're called to repent. We're called to live a holy life. So David says in the Psalms 38, I will be sorry for my sin. There is a personal accountability before God for our very own sin. In verse 17, we'll see that David will begin to beg God to judge him for this transgression and stop judging others for this bad decision. The depth of his sin was felt in the judgment from God against him. I, I cannot help but see that in that New Testament application that we just spoke about. Notice also how deep this goes. Look how far Satan deceives us. In verse 3, and Joab answered, The Lord make his 
people in hundred times so many more as they be. But my Lord, the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then doth my Lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? You know, we have all seen this as we've lived our Christian lives, have we not? That we trespass in sin. We sin against God, right? And here it is, Joab, one of David's mighty men, right? One of his leaders. And here, David has made trespass against God and commanded Joab to number the people. And in the same breath where David commanded Joab to number the people, Joab, this faithful servant to the king, right? He warns David to not do such an act because it's going to cause trespass against God. And you know what? David ignores him. You know, I find it interesting even for us today is that we are fighting the same enemy, Satan, right? We're in the trenches. This is spiritual warfare. We are at war with Satan. But has it ever amazed us how Satan seeks to blind the eyes of those who follow the Lord? That when they find themselves in a place where they have fallen into sin, this person who they said, I love you so much. I'm here with you. We're, we're warring together. We're preaching together. We're on fire together. And yet when you give them warning that they are making trespass against God, they totally ignore you because they're in sin. It's interesting that. And we've seen it, I, many people flooded to my mind in this situation. You know, even actually, so to say, in some situations, you could say even my own self. Where you do something and somebody says, hey, you know what, this ought not be so. Look at what the Bible says here. And immediately, this person who you loved and cared about so much is now on the outside. Like they don't know and you're right. This is the blindness of, of David's heart. So Joab asked David, why are you even making this trespass against Israel? Why are you even going to bring this upon us? Why are you going to bring us to a place where we're on the outside with God? You see this in verse 7, the destruction of these bad decisions. And God was displeased with this thing. Therefore, he smote Israel. This angered God greatly. I don't know if this is old. Ooh. <laughs> I think it is. And, um, and this angered God greatly. Matter of fact, God's chastisement brought David to a place where he said in verse 8, he said, I have sinned and I have sinned greatly you know this comes to mind what the lord says in first peter chapter 2 and verse 9 the lord knoweth how to deliver the ungodly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished god knows how to get our attention god knows how to bring to light that we have committed trespass against him it didn't take long at all. Matter of fact, the Bible says that God was displeased with this thing, therefore he smote Israel. There's two separate punishments that happened here. Not only do we have the smiting of Israel, but then down below in verse 12, God will give David the choices about how this smiting will continue on. But God immediately smote Israel for David's sin, and he was grieved. He said, I have sinned and I have sinned greatly. And so in verse 8, we see this. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing, but now I beseech thee, and do away with the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. Going on in verse 12, God gives David this choice. He sends the prophet Gad unto David. He said, either three years of famine or three months to be destroyed before thy foes, while that the sword of thine enemies overtaketh thee, or else three days the sword of the Lord 
even the pestilence in the land, and an angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coast of Israel. Now, therefore, advise thyself what word I shall bring again to him that sent me. David has this choice. Famine, sword of the enemy, or sword of the Lord. Judgment was definitely coming for him. David here in verse 13 and verse 14, we could uh, maybe, so to say, sympathize with David in this decision. David said in verse 13, and David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let me now fall into the hand of the Lord, for great are his mercies. But let me not fall into the hand of a man. David said, even on the worst day that I've sinned against God, even on the worst day that I've committed trespass against him, even when I am in open rebellion and the entire nation is feeling God's judging hand, it is still safer to be in the hand of a merciful God than the hands of wicked men. It is still safer to be in the hands of a merciful God than experiencing famine for three months. There is no place to be even when you've fallen out of the will of God than in the hands of a merciful God. Thank you, brother. That's the safest place to be. So look at this continual destruction. Verse 14. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. 70,000 men. You know, I couldn't imagine this. I, when I began to read verses 15 through 17, where God spares Jerusalem, God spares Jerusalem, and as he spares Jerusalem, the Bible says that, when David looks up on the threshing floor, now think about this. Imagine finding yourself in the position that you're inside this city. 50 to 70,000 people have died just from this second smiting. 70,000 people. Could you imagine the wailing of the city? Could you imagine the mourning? And David looks up here on the threshing floor and sees the angel of the Lord with the sword draw. Could you imagine that much grief resting solely upon your shoulders? Let's go ahead and read actually verse 15 through 17. And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying it, the Lord beheld and he repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed, it is enough, stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel, who were clothed in sackcloth, fell upon their faces. And David said unto God, is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, O oh Lord my God, be on me and on my father's house, but not on thy people, that they should be plagued. David cried out, I'm the one to be blamed here. I'm the one. It's my fault. Listen, he, he could have taken a number of different routes, so to say. David could have just reasoned with the Lord like we reason today. Lord, all I did was number the people. That's all I did. That's what the world today tries to do, right? They try to lessen the sin against God. It was just one look. It was, it's just sex. It's just cursing. It's just music. It's just a couple thoughts. It's just bad dress. No, David would say, no, it is all but sin against God. David said, we have made trespasses against God. 
It's more than just a look. It's sin. It's more than just cursing. It's sin. It's more than just dressing improper. It is sin. It's more than just filthy thoughts. It is sin. You can hear Paul crying out, in this, as you read this, thinking about the book of Romans, when he's calling us all to a higher understanding. Remember in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that which is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. This is what we're called to be, right? Wholly acceptable. This is where we find ourselves in the perfect will of God. David says in this 17th verse, it is no one else's fault but mine. You want to find yourself on a good place, on a good path to finding yourself at a right place with God? It starts right here in verse 17. Personal responsibility for your sin. It's my fault. No one else made you sin. No one else made me sin. I chose to sin. This is exactly where I was. The consequences of the decisions of my sin did afflict other people. It costed other people. Absolutely it did. Now here we see in verses 18 through 25, the deliverance of bad decisions. Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and set up an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And David went up at the saying of Gad, which he spake in the name of the Lord, and Ornan turned back and saw the angel and his four sons with him, with him and hid themselves. Now Ornan was now Ornan was threshing wheat. And as David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. Then David said to Ornan, grant me the place of this threshing floor that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord. Thou shalt grant it to me for the full price that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Ornan said unto David, Take it to thee, and let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. Lo, I give thee the oxen also for burnt offerings, and the threshing instruments for wood, and the wheat for the meat offering. I give it all. And David said to Ornan, Nay, but... I will uh, verily buy it for the full price, for I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings without a cost. There was deliverance here for bad decisions here. But notice in this sacrifice in which David was prepared to offer unto the Lord, David was not prepared to offer a sacrifice in which did not cost him anything. Serving the Lord cost us. Now, we like to think serving the Lord profit us, but there's some cost to serving the Lord. David said, the Lord that he serves, the God that he serves, even in this situation where he was at the receiving end of God's judgment, he was still worth sacrificing for. He was still worth giving his awful. He was still worth giving to be made right with God. I love when you see here in Ornan, which maybe will be another sermon another day. But he said, I give it all. I give it all to the king. I withhold nothing from you. You want the land, take the land. You want the oxen, take the oxen. You want the wheat, take the wheat. Whatever you want, take it. I give it all to you. Give it all to the king. What would happen in our own lives if in 2020, 
if we would get to a place in our own spiritual lives where we would arrive at a place of personal responsibility before God. Personal. It's a strange thing to talk about personal responsibility. And then when we talk about our own personal responsibility, we have to recognize that the personal responsibility we have to, when we sin to make those things right, doesn't have just personal results. It affects the body. It affects us all. It affects the church. We say to ourselves, we want to see the Lord bless Witten Place Baptist Church. We want to see it. We want the Lord to do mighty things here. We want the Lord to continue to send preachers out of here. We want the Lord to, to continue to send missionaries out of here. An, an, enough, enough to be responsible with our own sin and make it right before God? Do we want it that much? How much do we want God to work out of our church? Enough to say, Lord, I give it all. I've been holding back. I've been holding back from the king. I've been holding back here, holding back there. But now to this day, Lord, to make it all right, I want to give it all. What is it that prohibits us from being right with God? Now, everyone here may just already be right with God. Well, hallelujah. But for David, there was this overwhelming Affliction to his own heart to realize that he sinned in such a way, a man after God's own heart, that he sinned in such a way that it not only disrupted his fellowship with God, but it disrupted the entirety of God's people. This is where we all need to get in personal responsibility that we recognize that our sins interrupts not only our fellowship, but on days like this, it interrupts the fellowship of the entire body when there's sin in the camp. Ask Aiken, right? Time after time we read about this, how God purges the house. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we give thanks to you, Lord, and we thank you for this time as we glean from your word of First Chronicles chapter 21, Lord. We stand here, Lord, challenged and even in our own hearts, Lord, that, Lord, may we take this personal responsibility of our own sin. May we recognize this accountability of our own sin. Oh, Lord, though the world may not see it, though the other brothers and sisters may not see it, you know, Lord, you do. Lord, we thank you that even on our worst days, Lord, and even on our greatest days of sins and trespasses, there's no safer place to be than even in your hand, Lord. We thank you for your chastising hand that brought, brings us out of sin. Lord, we pray that you'll be with us, strengthen us in this hour. We give thanks to you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.